this is more typically what the boulder piles really look like down there. I showed you some examples of big fish, but really what is down there most often are these little pygmy rockfish, all these little guys swarming over the reef are pygmy rockfish and a rosy rockfish chasing after them to eat them. Baby cow cod, um, many of them actually, relatively speaking, that we saw, they're in deeper water. They live on less um, relief than the large ones. They're happy to be living next to a, a piece of cobble rather than the big boulder piles. And this is up on top of the reef. This is um, off Santa Barbara Island. This is in about probably 60 meters of water. So you can see there's ambient light, the color of the water has changed. Uh, lovely visibility the whole time we were there. These are all the 99 year class, the successful 1999 year class of Boccaccio rockfish, which is going to be one of the hopes for our recovery of Boccaccio really is the 99 and the 2000 year classes were pretty good. Some examples of some of the macroinvertebrates that are out there, sponges. Milton and I both thought we, after this cruise, wanted to be sponge biologists for a while because the sponges were awesome. Um, this is a new species of black coral that Milton and I got to name. This is the Christmas tree coral. Uh, we named it Dendrocristos is the genus. We didn't get to name it the, the genus, but we got to, or uh, Antipathies is the genus. We got to name uh, Dendrocristos, which means Christmas tree. Um, they grow to about 15 feet, 10 feet tall, and 20 or 30 feet across. Um, it was just amazing to all of us that no one has ever described these, seen these, it's not in the literature, and yet these guys are living right here in some of the most populated stretches of ocean that we have off the coast. And um, another example, that first one was the golden example, there's three color morphs, the white one, the gold one, and the red one. Um, right now we think they're all just one species, but we have a geneticist in Colombia, actually, uh, looking at these to see if uh, he can discern if there are more than one species, so maybe more than one new species. But um, just remarkable that uh, we saw little tiny ones and large ones, um, and all new to uh, to the scientific community. And here we are retrieving the sub, very easy. They hook it, they yank it out of the water, and within seconds the observer comes out and, and lets everybody know what we saw. So, we're going to continue on and I'll give you an exi some example of some of the results that we've been coming up with. But I've got to go back to this one. So, if you're all still hanging in there for a few more minutes, I will. So um, how do you survey an area this big, and this one too, 15,000 square kilometers, with that little tiny tool, that little sub? Um, luckily, we had available to us these great habitat maps that were put together by Gary Green at Moss Landing Marine Lab. He's a geologist. And he interpreted the seafloor based on uh, acoustic information, that uh, historic stuff, anything he could find, whether it was from side scan sonar, uh, some oil exploration maps, uh, grabs of the bottom, we put this all together and uh, interpreted it into things like the yellow and the blue are deep, deep water, soft sediments, and then these really bright colors like the reds and the greens and this right here are all what he would interpret from those bits and pieces of information as um, rocky outcrops. And what we're interested in is serving just the areas that would likely be cow cod habitat so that we can restrict the area, be more efficient with that tool, and not have to uh, survey the whole area. And so we were very happy that we could do that, use those maps. <coughs> and we got that survey down to about 9% of the whole area. And it's depicted in these red areas. So here's Tanner and Cortez Bank, 100 miles offshore. Um, Here's the area we surveyed around San Nicolas Island, Santa Barbara, and other reefs. There were about eight of them all together. These little black dots are all of our dives. We made 110 submersible dives. Um, we identified 119 fish species and many, many, many individual fishes. Here's how we do it really briefly. 
we use these quantitative transects where the little sub travels along a known distance. We look out the starboard side and count all the fishes, acroinvertebrates, substrata within two meters. For the cow cod, we increase the range um, by identifying the fishes and their distance from the sub to the fish. We need that for these complicated mathematical formulas that we use. Here's an example of one of the guys uh, on our team, Tom Leidig, uh, measuring a fish outside the sub. He's in the sub, measuring the fish with this little um, sonar gun. It's a scuba sonar gun that works really perfectly through these acrylic windows to give you a really good estimate of the distance of the fish to the sub. We put it into these simple formulas to, to calculate density of the fishes and total number of fishes on each one of those banks. So this is the first time that we are able to give bank by bank um, assessments of the total number of cow crop that are living on those banks. The way we assess the habitat along those transects here again, transects, we take the little sub and uh, videotape the whole thing. Here's the two meters uh, strip. And each one of those transects is not um, a uniform piece of landscape of all rock or all mud, but really everything out there is one mosaic of all of these types of uh, habitats. So what we do is we very carefully map and quantify each one of these habitats, whether it's mud cobble or big boulders or soft sediment. We quantify all of it and how many fish are in each one of those different types of habitats. And this is an example for you of what you actually see from the video. This is a 50-foot stretch of our video, all mosaic together to give you an idea of the rock boulder habitat and the fish, uh, fishes that live in it, just to give an example. The kinds of information that we're collecting are varied, and here's just some of them. Size distribution of the cow pod. We saw a significant number of juveniles and a lot of uh, larger fish, very, very few of the really maximum sized ones, as you can imagine, since we've been fishing for those for a long time, and they're hard to recover. Um, the important thing here is we were very, very happy to see these uh, young fishes, 15 to 20 centimeters. Those represent the 99 and 2,000 year class, which is gonna be our hope for recovering those rock, rock fishes, those cow cod, in the future. We also um, have depicted all the habitats, and the habitats in this, um, figure right here run from high relief, pinnacles and rocks, boulders, cobbles, and then it goes down to low relief, sand and mud. So here's all the habitats that we looked at. Here's the habitats that the big fish live in. The adult cow cod live very restricted in the cobble, boulder habitats. Very, very specific. And this is not unusual for rockfish. Rockfish have a tendency to be very specific about where they live. And they may live in all different habitats, different species live in different habitats, but they're very specific to those habitats. Um, the young fish, however, are more representative of living in uh, habitats that are more representative of what we survey. So we've got this very specific adults living in boulders. That's reflected in where those boulders are, too. So this is same thing, high relief all the way down to low relief, but it's depth. From shallow water to deeper and deeper and deeper water as you go down to the slide. What this is showing is that the rock piles, the boulders, which are right here, kind of diminish as you go deeper, and the mud and sand get more and more. Well, that's reflected in the distribution of the sizes of the fish, because the adults, this shows, are larger. Here's large up here. These are all big fish living in shallow water and the young fish living in deep water. And that's unusual. Usually rock fishes and fish in general settle out into shallow water and then as they get bigger, they go into deeper and deeper water. But in this case, because those adult fishes are found in boulders and the boulders are found in shallow water, you have to swim first. So that's uh, an interesting um, piece of information for our survey. This is the main part of the survey. This is what I was doing the survey for, to demonstrate and to use this information in the council's management um, uh, process to assess cow cod on a bank by bank basis. And so here are the eight banks along the bottom, each one of these. The adults are in red, the juveniles are in yellow. And we now have very good estimates of density and total abundance of those fishes on those banks. Um, 
just some of the examples to point out. Tanner Cortez, which is the furthest offshore bank, holds uh, the largest supply of adult and juvenile, really, a lot of juvenile rock fishes. And that's not really surprising because that is an area that's furthest offshore, has the least amount of pressure over the years, although there is pressure out there, but not as readily as some of these more uh, closely inshore um, banks. Some of the banks have no fishes left, no adults or juveniles. Some have many, many juveniles. Sam Nick looks like it's representing a nursery ground for cow cod. Um, so we're coming up with all kinds of new information on this. Um, this approach that we've taken is not really specific to uh, Southern California. I gave you the example of Southern California, but we're using that same kind of approach with habitat mapping and observing from a sub up and down the coast uh, along the Central California coast. These are the uh, study sites that I started with 12 years ago. We've been doing work on Hecate Bank off Oregon. Most recently I was up off of the uh, Queen Charlottes with um, scientists from British Columbia doing work very, very similar to this. So we now have a kind of a network of, of scientists doing this work. The last part that I'm going to talk about is an example of, of not rockfish, um, but uh, some of the research that we've been doing with Brian Chisso, who's a, an invertebrate zoologist up in Washington, and he and his students take our video, our archived videotapes, and actually glean more information on the macro invertebrates. So they're looking at uh, distribution and abundance of the macro invertebrates in the same areas that we look at cow cod. And there's all kinds of great reasons to do this. There are really a major component of the biodiversity down there on these deep reefs. And what we're interested in is, in particular, are they a component of habitat for fish? Are fish associated with these uh, Gorgonian corals and sponges and so forth? So we ask really simple questions. Where are the invertebrates? And do they have fish around them? Just some examples. Very habitat specific. Many of these are similar to the rock fishes themselves. Sea pans live in mud. Uh, some of these other things like crinoids live all over the place. And uh, these are brittle stars. And they live in specifically on boulders and rock. So we're finding those basic things out. This is the black coral, the Christmas tree coral that we discovered. And um, surprisingly, it lives very specifically in the same habitats that the cow cod, rockfish do. We asked uh, things like, what lives on black corals? Are they uh, important for fishes? Well, not a lot lives on them. Here's none. Nothing's <coughs> living on most of them. But you have some with some feather stars and sponges and so forth. Small fishes, not very many. So at least from our research, they don't represent a uh, very essential habitat for fishes, at least that we have discovered yet, except when they're dead. <laughs> this is an example of dead black coral, and you've got all kinds of stuff growing on them. And so it's just an interesting phenomena that uh, the live ones didn't have much of anything growing in those huge bushes, but um, when they're dead, all kinds of things, including cat shark eggs and uh, anemones and feathers, worms, all live on them. The distribution of those black corals is interesting because, again, remember we dove all through these uh, offshore banks. The gold dots are where we found the black coral, largely in one spot. And this is Hidden Reef. This is where we found the corals. Pretty significant number of, black, of uh, cow cod still. And that's also where we've been fishing for many, many years. And that's the example of the recreational fishing on Hidden Reef. And just to wrap up, what have we achieved thus far? Um, this is a first ever, really, on this coast of an independent assessment using visual techniques and habitat-specific techniques and non-extractive techniques, um, which is really important when you're looking at closed areas. Um, it's a first ever uh, survey of invertebrates on the coast. We discovered a new species of black coral, which is great. And we initiated this baseline now so that we can go back in five years or ten years or whenever uh, whenever, to be honest, when we get the money to do the survey, um, and start to collect more information so that we have more than just one data point on uh, cow cod. We can start to see, are they recovering? Are these closed areas doing their job? And that's what's next. We're going to extend the time series. We're improving our estimates of the rocky banks with seafloor mapping. And we're hoping to partner with Mexican scientists soon 
to start to do some comparative surveys on banks that might be less fish off Mexico, off northern Baja, and start to compare with some of these much more fish banks here in Southern California. Here is um, my tribute to all the people who worked on these projects with us and all the many, many uh, partners that we have, as well as where the funding has come from. And I will point out that the Packard Foundation was instrumental in starting, giving us the seed money to start this project. And now I'll end with, um, I'll end with a special Ask the Rockfish the questions. My first very of it.
do you differentiate a rockfish from anything else? It's actually a, a combination of very small things. Uh, rockfishes belong to uh, a, a group of fishes that include ling cods and uh, greenlings that all have what's called a suborbital state. They've all got a bone leading from the lower part of the eye over across their cheek. So if you have a suborbital state, that puts you among about eight families of fishes. Ringlings, the poachers, the rockfishes, things like that. So that that all of a sudden cuts off most of the fish on the planet. So there you get down to that. Then you have to look at well, how do you differentiate a rockfish? Uh, way back. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one: there's so many different types of, types of rockfishes. Is there really a unique niche for each one? What's the pressure that causes them to differentiate? Right. We don't know. This is amazing. We don't know. And and. Uh, I mean, it, it's kind of like they break the paradigm that each species has its own niche. I mean, worldwide for all species. I, I'm sure that's probably true, but it must be so subtle. And it may occur, for instance, when they're drifting around the plankton, for instance, where we're just totally baffled by stuff. But you're right. You look at a rock pile, and there's all these species of rockfish. And sometimes they're all schooling. Not all of them, but three or four species are schooling together, and they're eating the same thing. And going like, what the hell? So we don't. Which is the reason we work on it. Actually, working on rockfish is a is a uh, humbling experience because you, you think you know something, and then Mary and I will go down in the sub and we'll come back and go, I saw this rockfish. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I, it, I, you know, we've been looking for like 15 years, and we go, I don't know what it was. It was kind of red. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> Going to confession or something. You come out confused and cleansed. Yes. Stop. I'm Jewish, so I have no idea what I said. <laughs> but you guys evolved from me, so what the hell? This is one question which may be Yeah, actually, that was uh, that was uh, when I took my PhD written exam. My my major professor. That was the question he asked. Why are there supposed to be so many species of rockfish? And we're no nowhere near answering that. One thing um, that hasn't been looked at very much is that I'm, I'm relatively sure that in the, the mating act that rockfish have. Remember, they have internal fertilization. So a male and female have to first recognize themselves as the same species, and then. Somehow the female has to go, all right, whatever. Well, and I think for some species of rockfish, at least, the male actually lays down a pheromone, lays down a chemical trail, which signals to the female, I'm ready to reproduce, how about you, Jack? And it, it, it's quite possible that things like pheromones can evolve very slightly and, and wind up being very slightly different. And that may be enough so that uh, a rockfish that, that has evolved a very slightly different smell may actually be reproductively isolated from all the other fish that it's related to. I mean, you can actually get these kind of breaks in who reproduces <coughs> who. Uh, rockfishes also make noise. It hasn't been looked at very much. And again, if you have very subtle changes in the noise you make that only works with certain females of your group, all of a sudden only you guys are mating with each other, you've isolated yourself as, as a mating unit. So that's how speciation can occur. But really, I'm just. You use that figure about 50,000 years, and that's just. Yeah, there's actually, I'm, I'm sure that some of these so called cryptic species, where you, you think they all look the same, but they can tell each other apart genetically, that, um, we're dealing then with tens of thousands. There, and then we'll move this way. Do you see the abalone when you're down there? Um, we, uh, we don't. I've never seen any, not to say they're not there. And we do have a scientist in La Jolla that is actually surveying white abs in that area, Tanner Cortez. And has used the Delta before. And uses the Delta on. and uses an ROV, remotely operated vehicle, to look at them. And sees them, but not very many. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that way, and then we'll work our way back. Yes. You're pointing at this person. You're pointing at this person. Hello. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. Um, what do rockfish eat? Oh, it depends on the rockfish. Um, the fishes that live up in the water column a lot, like blue rockfish and yellow rockfish, 
they tend to eat things that live in the water, like plankton. Or they'll eat um, small fishes that come by, or squids. The rockfish that live at the bottom tend to eat things that live on the bottom with them. They'll feed on crabs. And they'll feed on talking school, <laughs> shrimp. And they'll uh, feed on Make me um, hungry. other fish. <laughs> other fish <that laughs> Often they'll feed on small rockfish. They'll feed on uh, octopus. Uh, um, that, that tends to, to be good. Hermit crabs. Amazingly enough, a lot of fish, not just rockfish, eat hermit crabs. Which, uh, I, I, I don't think they actually pick up them shell and all, but hermit crabs will get out of their shells right. and test other shells. That's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let that be a warning to all of us. <laughs> only for the night. Be happy with your shell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, in front and then in the back. Um, they have like in coal mines and stuff, there they're sensitive to methane gas. Is there any evidence that any of these fish are environmentally sensitive to pollution one type or another? Are you asking the like in the broadest case of any fish? Yeah, or is there anything you can say with some species might be more sensitive to that? Or is there any effect of pollution on that you can discern? <laughs> No, the answer to that. Rockfish is nothing really has to do with yeah. I mean, one thing that we, one thing we can say, and Mary and I were talking about this earlier, is that when you talk about why have rockfish declined in abundance, there's a tendency for some user groups to say, well, it's not fishing, it's pollution. And you know what? It ain't pollution. It's not pollution at all, as far as we can tell. In fact, for most species, it's not pollution. There are, there is evidence for uh, teratogenic effects, for uh, mutational effects of pollution on uh, larval stages of fishes. That's been shown all over the world. Uh, there's evidence for things like tumors to form. If you go to Puget Sound and you look at the flatfish that sit on the bottom as an ugly place, you find higher levels of tumors. But in rock fishes, you just don't see anything like that. And, Part of it is they don't tend to live in, in heavily polluted areas anyway. They tend to live more on the open coast and, and away from pollution sources. Pollution is the least problem most fish populations have worldwide. The, the greatest problem is people catching too many of them in every way. You know, gill nets, as was mentioned there, hook and line are called. That's the big issue. Now, question? Uh, first, a comment on, on the pollution. That Considering you spent your youth catching rockfish off San Monica Pier, have you checked your body burden of DGT? <laughs> you know, I have a story to tell about that. <laughs> there was a big lawsuit between the, Mon uh, between the federal government and the Montrose yeah, Chemical Company. Remember that? The Montrose Chemical Company produced DDT in the 50s and 60s, legally dumped it into some of it into the ocean, where it wound up off Palos Verdes, and then Congress made that retroactively illegal in the 70s, and then the federal government went after the chemical company, which didn't exist anymore, but other companies owned it. And they said, uh, uh, we're suing you for $2 billion for stuff that you did that was legal, but is now illegal. And uh, I was actually hired by the forces of evil to be on their side. I was hired by uh, the chemical companies to do studies and to review the government's studies. And the government spent $7 million on a study where they fed DDT to kelp bats to see if that uh, had any effect on reproduction. And at the end of the study, th this is a long story, but I will just give you the punch, one of the punches. It turned out high levels of DDT and kelp bass had no effect whatsoever on reproduction, except it made sperm more modal. It actually improved <laughs> sperm motility. <laughs> so if you're asking the effects on me, my little guys are peppy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sometimes at night, late at night, no, I don't know. Right. Too much energy. <laughs> when we wrote the Rockfish book, that was Mary's usual role. Other than writing some of it, she'd go, you can't really say that. We'll be kneecapped, the mafia will be kneecapped. All right, can I ask my question now? Yo, yo, your question, I'm sorry. Um, you talked a little bit about this before when you talked about speciation. You know, you said, several times you said, these two fish are very closely related. And you keep talking about genetics, which is relatively new. So, right. 
Uh, is there still interbreeding between closely related species of rockfish, or is there a, uh, or can you tell, or there, are there yeah, you, you can sort of tell, you can tell genetically, certainly, and you can sometimes tell phenotypically by looking at it. There, there is hybridization between certain species of rockfish. Interestingly, almost all of it occurs in Puget Sound, between three species of rockfish, quillbacks, browns, and coppers. And you do get hybrids, and in fact, you can look at the fish and you go, I don't know. Is it brown? Is it cop? And if you look at it genetically, you can see that it may have had a mother who was one species and a father who was the other. Now, why um, anti-hybridization mechanisms break down in Puget Sound, whereas on the open coast, they don't hybridize. No one knows. So there is some hybridization, but there's not a lot. But again, like why? I don't know. That's the reason we work on it. Uh, there was a question there, and then a question there, the guy, you, you, sir, in blue just gave up. And uh, you're looking you're sullen. Um, so, um, <laughs> or sleepy, I don't know. Uh, so there's a question way in the corner. Oh, I just had a question. What effect, if, if any, if you have observed the uh, uh, submersible lights or sound on the behavior of these fish? Yeah, we actually did recent research on that. With that camera that looks out ahead of it, you can see for a greater distance. And at least with cow cod, no uh, noticeable difference at all. I mean, you can see the cow cod doing what it's doing way in the distance. And then as the sub approaches, and we survey with a survey camera, same exact behavior, same exact position. So nothing that we can notice. With this, those kinds of species, there are species of rockfish that we can't survey very well because of that. There are some that are attracted to the sub, and then there's some that are repelled from the sub. Well, they obviously have good vision. Uh, is, is a very dark area that you're surveying. Why does the light have an effect on the I mean, they seem to be on the film of Lucas. Yeah. So, I mean. And no one has done any research on vision with rockfishes to be able to discern that. Um, there's a new proposal that's being um, submitted this year to start to look at that. But nobody has. The lights that we use are not really high intensity bright lights as opposed to the ROVs, the larger ROVs that have really high intensity lights. Ours are purposely low level light. So that can be one thing. Also, why questions in biology are, are really hard to answer. I mean, why does something do something? It's just, that's a hard area even to address. Nope. Oh, that's yeah. Oh, I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> I bring it up just so you wouldn't be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, I'm married and heterosexual. You showed a lot of early data on, on rockfish. What was the early data? Okay. Uh, the original information that we had in that one slide that was that was declining. That information comes from um, sketchy information. Um, because we don't have a lot of really good information in the 60s. The earliest we had was in the 1960s, and that comes from recreational um, catch information that was collected. Um, we do have long uh, time series of marble surveys, young surveys, and from those surveys, you can do some analyses to surmise what the adult population is like. So they piece together those two, the kinds of surveys that are available, which isn't much. Yes. But are you happily married? <laughs> <laughs> this time I am. For 17 years. Ouch. This time I am. However, in case it runs afoul, you have a card. <laughs> because you're just so sweet. <laughs> I got a submarine question. I am. You're familiar with David Packer's Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Center. I had a science show up there and went out on their ROV trips. But that's a tethered vehicle. And the thought of you going at one and a half knots uh, with no way. What's your, what's your, what are your batteries? Do you have redundant batteries, redundant propulsion? Do you have a rescue ship? How do you deal with that? We run that sub until it's out of juice. It's an electric sub, and we literally go down and use it until the lights go out and we can't do anything anymore. And then it floats out? And then we... 
buoy it up and we come to the surface. It's really easy to use. Well, we do like candles. <laughs> the only time Mary Mary's actually been using this stuff longer than I have, and we've never had. Uh, they've run. They've done over six thousand dives. They've dove on the Lusitania. They've dove on all over the world. It's actually a little work. Does the ship know where you are, or you fall? Yeah. No, it has no idea where we are. And so, <laughs> actually, uh, Mary didn't bring it up. You want to talk about the NASA? Yeah, there's a um, acoustic pinging device that it tracks and it knows where it is at all times. And in fact, it's very, very close to the sub. At least close to it, not over it. And that's how we track it. We need to track it very carefully to get those lengths of transect for our analysis. Oh, yeah. So, yes, it knows where it is at all times in, in what depth it is. And there's one pilot, or three pilots. One is on the bridge of the ship talking to the sub pilot at all times in contact. So, that's a good question. And well, actually, there are there, currents a lot stronger than one and a half. Well, miles. actually, when there's a very strong current, sometimes we can't operate the cell. Yeah. Or we at least can't operate in, in that distance, in that direction. The only time I've ever kind of had your kind of thought processes like, how much air do I have in the sub, um, was uh, on the big survey that Mary and I did when we were first starting to look at these black corals. We were off uh, Santa Barbara Island in Hidden Reef, and there was this huge, probably the biggest colony black coral I ever saw. In and Pilot Joe and I were going along counting fish, and I said, oh, look at that. Let's stop the transect and let's go pick a, a frond from it so we could uh, start analyzing it. And he said, well, we can't go to the, the tip of it where the, the colonies are very thin and easy to break off because I can't maintain position. But we can go down the bottom, and we can use the, there's a little grabber arm that you kind of extrude by, by brute force out, and it grabs stuff. It's just awful. And uh, I said, okay. So we went down into it, into the, this huge tree-like thing, and we grab uh, one of these branches, and it's about this thick, and I'm going, okay, well, that's good. And, uh, and he starts backing us out, and it, it, we don't move. You know, it's, 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 it's studying, that's a part of the colony. It's like branch, oh, a tree branch, so, okay. And he can actually um, release uh, uh, ballast so that he goes upwards, and he's pulling. Couldn't do it. So I go, Joe, this isn't going to work. Let's just uh, undo us, and we'll find uh, So uh, uh, he tries to undo it, and we can't undo it ourselves. <laughs> and, and I thought, I thought, so much air do we have? <laughs> we have about two days. And I thought, uh, how again do we get rescued? How, how, I remember 10 years ago, they told me, I'm starting, you know, I'm starting to sweat just a little. I'm starting to glow. You know, just a little. And meanwhile, Mary is up on the bridge going, what the hell is going on? You know, they were counting fish. They said they stopped. Well, you and can tell they were stopped because we're tracking them. And they're right. just sitting there. So, so Mary calls down and goes, uh, you know, what are you doing? And Joe's going, oh, uh, we'll be ready in a second. I'm thinking to myself, we're going to die. <laughs> and Joe is like, no pulse. And I was uh, like this. And finally, you know, by brute force, we just shook it until it, it broke loose. That was the only time I, I started actually asking those questions. <laughs> Any other? The whole life passed before me, and I had never done anything in 50, <laughs> five years. That was the most <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Have you gone on any expeditions up uh, Point Marguello, the platforms up there? Yeah, yeah. We worked from uh, Irene. We've done, I've done almost every single platform from uh, here to Arguello. The only platform I've never attempted was one of the Exxon platforms. They were working on it. They were drilling that day and they didn't want us. But we've tried every platform. Sometimes the visibility isn't good enough to hit the bottom, so we haven't done a good survey. But yeah, Hidalgo actually is one of my favorite platforms. The one probably familiar with uh, off of our uh, Guayo because it has such a huge diversity of fish and really heavy densities. So it's a beautiful platform. Whatever you think about it. You know. Other question? One other? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I saw that you had a CPD mounted to the exterior of the sub and I know that that measures various uh, physical chemical parameters. Um, were there any instances where you saw almost identical outcrops and basically the same depth in close proximity, one had a huge assemblage of rock fishes or diversity and virtually opposite of the other. And did you try to correlate in some of the physical chemical parameters? Have you ever seen that? 
one thing that I have to admit, we haven't, we do collect temperature information and we don't use it to its best uh, availability, I guess, at all. So that's something that we do need to do sometime. So the answer to that is we haven't seen it because we haven't looked for that. But looking at outcrops that are right next to each other, no, they're always something very dramatically different. Like the one that I showed in the video that had huge numbers of, of fishes and diversity, it was isolated all by itself. So that alone makes it unique in that it's surrounded by a sea of mud, kind of sand mud, and then you've got this outcropping. But um, that's all I can really think that would be. Yeah, the, the, the only exception is something like if on this side of Anacapa, mm -hmm. there's um, there are these low lying ledges that are made of sandstone, and they're about twice as high as this as this stage. In other words, they, the ledges come up about this high. And what you will see is some of the ledges have no, uh, uh, un they're not undercut at all. They're just straight vertical faces. And then you'll come along and there'll be a gap, and all of a sudden you see another ledge and it has a big cave in it. And that's where you do see a difference. Mm -hmm. the, the, the ledges that have caves will have a lot of rockfish in them. And the ledges that look identical, and they are identical, they're literally identical, except they don't have a cave, cave they have very few fish. And that's because these fishes like caves. So that you do see. But you almost never see two apparently similar rock piles with vastly uh, different fish. Is that like salinity DO and the other parameters? Yes. Temperature. temperature, and we use it mostly right now for depth. That's our depth recorder okay. right now. Well, the question, well, you've been very brave, if that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Please go. Thank you.